I'm going to talk about something that's really difficult to talk about, but it is imperative that we actually talk about it. But I'm going to give everybody a trigger warning and tell you because it's very heavy and because it might get heavier than even expected, if you need to give yourself time and space to step away, please do so. And when you're ready, feel free to come back. But it is a heavy conversation. Whoops, the mic's not being nice today. <laughs> it is a heavy conversation because those of us in the mental health field who have been working with the Muslim community for a long time, we've been seeing changes over time. Some of these changes are actually not necessarily new. It's just that we're more alert to them. And in the topic of mental health, would you guys agree that in the last five years at least, there's been a lot more conversations around mental health than ever before? Do you remember how in your masajid, and maybe that's still true, in your community centers and other spaces that you're in, they would never really have a topic on mental health and call it mental health? I remember in a time where when we wanted to do topics that were very specific, like for example, substance abuse, and we would want to actually call it that, there would be one person to show up in the room. <laughs> and then they would actually start pulling people from the hallway like, come on in, come on in. Because it was so taboo and so difficult to talk about that nobody wanted to go in or even be associated with somebody that went into the room to talk about mental health, lest they too be called crazy. SubhanAllah, the tides have shifted. You have actresses and actors, activists, athletes, all people, all types of people who are open and talking about mental health now and how they're seeking out therapy and support. And they're being open about that journey. And you have, on the other hand, a lot of our religious leaders and imams, I realize it may not be your imam, okay, mashallah, <laughs> but there are, in fact, those within the religious community that are also standing up and saying, all right, enough is enough. We're going to be open and talk about this. There are even some who are willing to say that they themselves or their family members are going through therapy, and I think that's an amazing change of tides. But here's what I'm going to talk about today. Even with the changes that are happening, there's some real serious stuff, subhanAllah. Not just the mental illnesses that you may hear about that have names like depression or anxiety, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and so on and so on, but also things that maybe don't necessarily have names or you don't know what to call them within yourselves or your loved ones. Just feelings of angst, if anything that this pandemic taught us, is that all kinds of uncertainties coming with it. When is this gonna end? I don't know. Am I really truly, you know, vaccinated enough against Omicron? I don't know, right? SubhanAllah, there's just so much uncertainty and that builds in you a sense of anxiety and angst, even if you're not somebody that has clinical anxiety. Right? Isolation, which many of us going into lockdown, out of lockdown, into lockdown, out of lockdown, it's been hard. And the close quarters you've kept with family and those, whoever you live with, roommates and so on, or if you've been completely isolated alone, is also wrecked havoc on ourselves. And so I think finally the conversation around mental health is finally being had in a more open manner. And you know me, I'm all about this is not a new story to the Muslims. If you've heard me speak before, you've heard me talk about the history of mental health and the heritage of mental health and how Muslims had always been at the forefront of this discussion. Always. Because in our worldview as Muslims, mind, body, and soul are together. You never separate them out. And because of that, the early Muslims always had treatment centers and healing centers for all kinds of mental health conditions. And they were the first to do what? You guys answer, come on. They were the first to build what? And what are the medicines? The hospitals, the healing centers that had what in them? That had in them, yes, my body and soul, but what did they have that was special that no other hospitals in the history of humankind had before the Muslims? Mental health wards, exactly. When you think about how do you have a civilization that the others before, Greeks and Romans and all the rest, couldn't do. What is it about Islam that prompted that? Because there's something, and this is where we're going to talk about when people have that stigma or that shame or I'm not going to go and get help. This is very important to remember, that you all, we all, are part of a heritage that never separated out mind, body, and soul. They were always connected. 
And because of that, our healing centers and institutions, it's no surprise that they have the mental health within it. I'm talking about talk therapy. Did you know Muslims were the, some of the first to develop talk therapy? You know the talk therapy that your mama tells you, or your khala, or whoever, tells you, no, 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 no. We Muslims don't do that. That is a shame to us that somebody would say that Muslims don't do that when the Muslims themselves were the ones who created talk therapy. Come on now, subhanAllah. Sound therapy, music therapy, natural sounds and feelings, emotions with aroma therapy and color and sound, all of it was integrated into these healing centers. Why do I make a big fuss about this? Because I'm tired of the stigma. I'm tired of the shame that surrounds mental health. And I'm tired of people, when they're talking about this topic, calling others like it's an other thing, like it doesn't affect them. They're the ones who are crazy and don't call me that because I don't have that. The reality is we all have that. <laughs> you can't have lived through this pandemic and not have something related to mental health with my all deference and respect to you. Every one of us, if it's not clinically diagnosed, it is there right under the surface whether it be a depression or an anxiety or something more serious, it is right under the surface in each and every person. Am I making too bold of a statement? Am I exaggerating? So the end of the line for mental health when we worry about people not getting the help they need, either they start to spiral down and things get really tough Right? And they think, I can do this by myself. I'm a mu'min, I'm a believer, I believe in God, I can do this. God's gonna see me through, inshallah, God will see you through. But God also gave you the means to get the help you need. The means, the early Muslims, when they built these institutions that I'm talking about, this wasn't lip service to the sunnah. This was actually understanding the sunnah. This was understanding the ahadith that say things like, when Allah sends down an illness, he sends down its cure. Well, if Allah is going to send illnesses like mental illnesses, then clearly he also has for them what? Cures, treatments, professionals, people who know how to help you. This is part of our sunnah. And the early Muslims had no shame and stigma around this. In fact, they built these amazing, beautiful institutions, fountains and greenery. We have these papers coming, I'm not going to bore you with our research papers, you can read them, inshallah, at our website at the lab, the Stanford Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology Lab, talking about the talk therapies, the music therapy, the aroma therapies, the gardens, and so on and so forth. Holistic. Holistic. I named the nonprofit that relates to my lab, Maristan, after these institutions, because it is my dream, inshallah, that we revive the Maristans. This is my dream. Inshallah, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're actually going to revive this Islamic tradition and heritage where you, when you get the help you need, it's holistic. It has mind, body, and soul. It has the spirituality because as Muslims, you don't take that away from us. You've got to keep the Islam in it. <laughs> You've got to keep the connection to God in it. And honestly, secular psychology has lost its soul. That's not me talking. That's what the literature says. And now the new wave is bring your whole self into therapy. Well, everyone in this room, for you to bring your whole self into therapy, that means bringing all of your identities into therapy. And if you are a Muslim, that's one of your identities. Is that right? So now I'm going to tell you something that's really difficult. The end of the line, when people do not get help, not only do they Effect, they're affected themselves, but their family members are too, their loved ones, their friends. It's a ripple effect. You have to realize it's not just you. And when you say, I'm going to rely on myself, I'm going to do this alone, you don't realize that sometimes not only are you harming yourself, but you're also harming the people around you because they don't know what to do either. They see you suffering. They want you to be better. And it's affecting them too. So there's a certain part when people say, I'm going to do this on myself, that's selfish. Part of connecting to the broader circles is understanding that you are part of a bigger system. And when we don't get the help we need, the end of the line that I worry about, and the reason we wrote the paper that you just heard about and published it this summer, and people kept saying, don't publish that, don't publish that, 
it's going to make the Muslims look bad. Wallahi, even after we published in, so I'm telling you, in the highest ranking medical journal, JAMA, which is the Amer Journal of American Medical Association, it is hard to get anything in that journal unless it's like really rigorous and really well studied. Even after it was published there, we had people, imams and different people and so on, and not just imams, even regular people, call it false news, fake news. I'm like, really, people? <laughs> Really? Have you seen the community lately? Mashallah. Do you know how to do research? No, anyway, mashallah. <laughs> I don't know. Allah Akbar. The, but the reality is, it was so hard for people to stomach the results that came out of it. So what were the results? In brief, we compared Muslims to all other faith groups, Christians, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, and people of no faith, atheists and agnostics. And when we compared Suicide attempts, okay, this is where the trigger warning comes in, attempts, we found that Muslims had double, yes, I just said double, double the rates of suicide attempts from other faith groups or non-faith groups. I didn't expect that. I knew it was high because I could see it in my practice and I could see it in all the people that I supervise and all the cases that are coming through for mental health. I could see it. We knew there was something high, but we didn't know how high. Now, mind you, I didn't say death by suicide, because that's a different category. And alhamdulillah, fatabarakallah, Muslims are still at the very low end of that. But when you increase attempts, you're going to increase deaths by suicide eventually, too. It's going to catch up, and that's the fear. So what do you do? So I'm going to share something with you, because when people hear bad news, they're like, oh no, now what, now what? This lab that we do the research in, and I told you about the nonprofit we started, I am committed, like 110% committed, to making sure that all of our Muslim leaders, our activists, our community, and religious leaders are all trained to work on this topic of suicide. It is not easy. I went through entire medical school and psychiatric residency and high-level specialty. I'm a professor at Stanford, subhanAllah, and I didn't know how to deal with this. I had to get extra training in this. So if anybody feels like they know how to do this, even as a mental health professional, they don't. It is specialized training. To talk about suicide prevention, which is all about education. And this is, I want you to know some very important things before we kind of close today with this topic. One, suicide is 100% preventable. There is no other mental health condition that I can tell you about that is 100% preventable. This one is, because it's about education. It's about knowing the signs. It's about intervention. It's about helping. It's about bridging people to care before it gets too late. Now, I know there might be people here who have lost loved ones to suicide, and my, all my love goes to you. May Allah make it easy for you. And you may be thinking, but how was that, how was that prevent, subhanAllah, I'm not talking about individual cases. Rather, I'm looking into the future and telling you that if there is solid interventions in place and our communities are willing to talk about this very difficult thing and be trained how to appropriately intervene, we can prevent so much. You know what inspires me? There is an ayah in the Qur'an that you know as, as well, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Whoever saves a life, it is though they have saved all of humanity. This is a, this is a Muslim-driven mission. It is part and parcel of our Islam. When someone says, no, no, that's not part of our story, it is. So you know what I want you to do? If you're already on social media, people, parents get mad at me, they're like, you just told our kids to get on social media. <laughs> I'm like your kids already are on social media, friends. Mashallah. <laughs> Mashallah. Anyhow, if you are there, check out the handle. Go to Maristan, at Maristan underscore org. M-A-R-I Stan, S-T-A-N. I want you to follow that account specifically because this is where all the trainings and education is coming out. We're putting out, mashallah, every week is coming out all kinds of resources. That handle and also the one for the lab the Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology Lab at Stanford. If you want little kind of knowledge bites, size, but you know, bite-sized pieces around mental health, these are some great accounts to follow because we're constantly taking all that academic research that we're doing and translating into things that all of you can benefit from. 
we have these articles and we have these little charts of things of like what happens what to say and what not to say. Wallahi subhanAllah, sometimes people just get stuck. They want to say something. They want to help someone who's in trouble or they feel like someone is not doing well or maybe someone has had a loved one who actually did pass from suicide and they feel stuck. They don't know what to say. And then you worry about saying the wrong thing and then you don't say anything at all and that's just like a whole spiral, right? So we have these tips and techniques for you. If you check the website and you follow it, you can download all kinds of resources to help you and your communities. I want you, whatever masjid you come from, whatever community center or you know, organization you're connected to, go to that page, maristan.org, go and download the khutbas and give it to your MSA khatib, give it to your imams. There is ones that are literally completely written out on suicide prevention and it follows all the standardized really rigorous scientific knowledge on how do you talk about suicide, but of course all the fiqh parts of the correct ways of saying the khutbah. Written, the whole thing is written out. There's one on prevention. There's one on postvention, which is what you do in the aftermath. There are resources for you at your fingertips if you know where to go and look at them. So please do. And the last thing I'll say, inshallah, about this topic is we have a campaign. It launches in just a few days. It's called the 500 Imams Campaign that Maristan is launching. You know what the goal is? That no less than 500 imams, religiously trained women and men, ustad and ustadas, are trained in suicide response and certified in it in 2022. Inshallah. The goal, inshallah, inshallah, inshallah. The manual that comes with that, we took years of writing, years of research, but it's like a 100-page manual, and you can't really give a local leader <laughs> a manual 100 pages and say, now go do this. So we developed the training. And everything is kind of what we call in medicine and science evidence-based. So we do all this research and make sure it's working. Alhamdulillah, we have all of our IRB and ethics approval, not the, re not the boring research stuff that I'm going to bore you with, but just to let you know that this is very sound information. But you know what's special about it? Every resource that I looked on on the topic of suicide was either too secular, so when you tried to give it to the religious leaders, hmm, yeah. It didn't really work. And on the other hand, there were other resources, but they weren't scientifically rigorous enough. They weren't accurate. So we took the two and kind of married them together. So now these imams and community leaders and youth leaders and MSA leaders and so on, they realize that the training that they're getting is something that speaks directly to them. What do I do at the janazah prayer? Do I make du'a for this person? How do I help the person, the family that's left behind and so on and so forth? All of this is dealt with in the training and it's a certificate training. And all of you can eventually take this as well because we hope to make it virtual, inshallah ta'ala. If there's anyone here who's interested in kind of supporting this and kind of um, making sure that it comes to your communities, let us know. You go to barristan.org and kind of let us know, talk to us in there or through our DMs on our social media. But here's what I want to tell you. The last study that came out about how many Muslim centers are there in America, do you know how many there are? How many masajid do we have in America? That's a lot, <laughs> I love it. Give me a number. You, very close. 2,500 is really close. It's about 3,000. 3,000 masajid in America. You know what my five-year plan for Maristan is? I want all 3,000 masajid trained. Say amin. Amin. Allahumma amin. And with that, inshallah, I'm turning it over to Linda, inshallah. But we'll keep on this conversation going because we need to have these conversations going. We need them to be open. But I'll tell you what else we need them to be. We need them to be grounded in accurate knowledge. This is where the researcher and professor and Dr. Ami comes out, okay? But we also need it to be grounded in actual Islamic information. And this is where my Sharia training comes out. You gotta put the two together in order for it to actually work for our communities. So may Allah bless you. May this come to as ease and help to your communities, inshallah. And please do make dua and support the missions because these are not easy. Trust me, it is not easy to roll out mental health work or to even get it funded. But please, inshallah, with your duas and support, because we, like the ayah says, we need to save even the one life. You've saved like all of humanity in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is barakallahu feekum. Wa sallallahu ma'ala sayyidina